Back in the days before restructure, we were a collection of congregations, agencies, organizations, and institutions. In the International Convention days, everybody came and everybody could vote. Uh, if you were in this one part of the country, it might be that uh, the culture of that particular part of the country would hold sway. And it was felt that uh, to, to be the kind of body that we needed to be, we needed to have representative uh, assemblies with every congregation and every institution and every uh, region having voting representatives. Willard Weckheiser spoke to the Council of Ministers about restructuring. Then we will be in a better position to talk to other denominations. In 1960, finally, a, a resolution came to uh, the Louisville International Convention that we should appoint a Commission on Brotherhood Restructuring. Ronald Osborne was key uh, in, in the lectures that he gave about the nature of the church. And they had also appointed a panel of scholars. In 62, a Commission on Brotherhood Restructure was appointed. And uh, they began their work then. Dale Fires had been the president of the United Christian Missionary Society. And then he moved over to become the executive secretary of the International Convention. He became a strong leader as they began to do the work of the restructure. One of the first resolutions that came from the Structure Commission was that the International Convention become a representative assembly. That was coming to the 1966 uh, International Convention. However, there were complications. Martin Luther King was invited to be the speaker in Dallas in 1966. And the local arrangements committee were up in arms about our inviting Martin Luther King. Dale Fires and um, the leaders of the International Convention stood fast against that. He felt that, that uh, we would go through with restructure, but he thought that if, if anything could cause it to come unglued, it was our preparations and what was happening with the Dallas folk. But he insisted, and of course, we're all glad that he did. And that was the, the foundation on which we then went forward. I think the most important aspect of the merge agreement and the design were that is that they were conceived and considered as part of a wider context of being church. The merger agreement coming from um, African-American disciples who really believed that the disciples should and could model what it meant to be one whole and complete church. Going back to the early days when Preston Taylor even formed the National Christian Missionary Convention, which eventually merged into or with the International Convention, he organized the church to help the Christian church avoid a heresy, a heresy of racism, discrimination, and separation. I'm reminded of uh, when the Queen of Sheba met Solomon, and she says, the half has not been told. And that is true about Preston Taylor. After he learned embalming, and he later purchased land to build the Greenwood Cemetery, he built a funeral home. He had a casket factory. He helped to establish Tennessee State University and also the first colored bank there in Nashville. And it, it just goes on and on. We say that Preston Taylor is our benefactor. He did everything he could to help the African-American churches 
of the disciples of Christ. So he was quite prolific in, in uh, his work in um, building up the black community and in building up the church and realized as a part of his work with the church that um, we needed to be a part of the larger church. There were more and, and more black people around the country in disciples' congregations, but there was not uh, an organization that uh, brought them together. In 1916, they began to talk about having this convention for the African American churches. And in 1917, it happened. The National Christian Missionary Convention was our convention. It's where we uh, develop our leaders. It's where we made decisions. And here we were saying to a larger body, uh, we'll run the risk that uh, we can still do it. A merger committee was established in 1966. They asked the church strongly, are you with us? Are we one? If, if we are, then let's become one. White people of conscience who, who began to agree, said, okay, if this is the church, let's see if we can become one church. We're looking at the whole decade of the 60s, what was going on in the black church, but also the black community. One has to see it as an absolute unbelievable event in 69. August 5th through 10th of 1969 was the last gathering of the National Christian Missionary Convention. Uh, Raymond Brown was the, uh, was the president of that last body. Raymond uh, kept saying to me and others that it took a lot of trust to pull that off. I think maybe it must have been in um, maybe 1966. I came back into the hotel and I walked down the hall and when I looked in this room, it was uh, my father Charles Webb and, and Emmett Dixon and Raymond Brown and A.C. Stone, uh, all of these guys who were a part of this a merger and conversation. I, I stood out there in the hall and, and listened to them. That energy, that focus, that determination on the part of that group of folk was what helped us, helped to move us from uh, where we were to where we are now. Amen. This was not a situation of uh, the church uh, looking at this as a mission project, but um, two groups of people coming together to the table as whole groups of people saying, let's show the world what this could look like and really model a reflection of God's unity on the earth. And at the same time, all the other currents that are happening within our whole church, the ecumenical movement, our movement for the brotherhood to consider its restructure and what that whole church would look like. Actually, I think design is really a kind of ingenious uh, um, middle way between the two uh, of uh, providing enough shape that uh, we, we will have a community, but uh, not, you know, not too much structure uh, so that, uh, you know, the spirit uh, will get fossilized within it. If this system is to work, then uh, there has to be real trust among folk because nothing is there that is ecclesiastically binding that connects congregations to regions, to regions to the General Assembly. What we have instead is the covenant, <laughs> we call a covenant, which means people have to voluntarily live up to uh, what's in there and cooperate. I've always wondered about the, the language of design. 
I mean, it, it struck me as odd. It turns out that the 1948 World Council of Churches Assembly in Amsterdam is coming out of the, the ashes of World War II in Europe. The theme was man's disorder and God's design. From the very beginning, the, the, the process of restructure and the very notion of the, de, of the design um, was deeply rooted in this fundamental theological uh, conviction uh, that we needed to structure ourselves, we needed to live our lives according to God's design for the church. So we have a tendency to think about only ourselves when we speaking about restructure. But the many leaders at that time really uh, wanted to reflect on who we are in the, the grand movement of ecumenism. We cannot actually really achieve the unity by just saying that we can go back to the New Testament church and then voila, here is uh, God's unity. No, we have to clearly say who we are. And from there, we can go to uh, an ecumenical tables and then say, this is how we understand God's grand design for the humanity. It was a provisional design, and part of the spirit was that we would always be in this continual process of theological reflection, spiritual growth and renewal, and that we would always be asking the question, what is God's design for the church? And how are we structured now, and does it still make sense? Does it still help us? to live out what we now believe in this moment, in this context, to be God's design for the church. There have been times when it has been changed that have been very difficult to change, but I think that speaks to the fact that we, we know it's important and that we need to be uh, precise and careful uh, to make change for the right reason. I see this colliding of so many ships going in their own directions, um, yet all calling out to God. Tell us your vision. Tell us what you want. The design provided a way for all of those boats to begin to go with the current according to the way God was moving the waters. Do I believe that, that we're supposed to all function in the same way and, and move in the same way um, because of our beliefs and our theology? No. I think that's the beauty of disciples, personally. That's why I'm a disciple. And we're reminded every once and again um, that God's will is beyond our imagination. That God's will is not confined in the pages of a design. That we are called as the body of Christ to allow those pages to live and morph with us. I believe that the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, has designed the best way of being the Church of Jesus Christ in Western culture. I believe that. Unfortunately, we've not always followed our own design. But it's not a design problem, it's a follow problem. What we have now uh, is not certainly enough, uh, but uh, uh, it's there so that we will never forget and uh, uh, will also serve as, uh, you know, kind of a beginning point to uh, improve uh, issues of justice regarding uh, uh, racial, ethnic uh, communities and uh, other communities of uh, oppression. Maybe now is the time as we celebrate to, to affirm how important that really is, to really take all the talent, the lay teachers, the scholars, um, and really create resources for ourselves so that we can hand that off um, before it's too late, that we can really uh, help give people those things that differentiate us as disciples. Well, this is a great day to be the minister of the church. I think it requires more knowledge, more stick to more diplomacy, more courage than at any time in my active years. But if, if, if I were 
starting over, I'd do it again.